The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extolled. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We're looking at how to identify God's church. There are different identifying marks that you can see on God's church. We talked last time a little bit about counterfeit currency. In order to spot counterfeit currency, you examine and learn the identifying marks of genuine currency. Genuine currency has holographic images, for example. It's printed on a certain type of paper. It may even have a certain type of smell. And when you learn those identifying marks, you can examine counterfeit currency and spot the differences. And you can know that that type of currency is fake if it does not bear the identifying marks of the genuine. Similarly, in the same process, if we go to God's Word to read the identifying characteristics of the original church of God, We look in the Bible to say what was the original church of God like, then we can compare any church today to those same identifying marks to determine if it is genuine or if it is counterfeit. It's that simple. The big question we have so much in the world today and the confusion that exists, why are there so many churches? When we go to the Bible, we don't read of hundreds and hundreds of different faiths different religions, different churches. We read of one. And God established one. So we must therefore conclude Satan and man have been very busy creating others to fit their desires. And when we go to the Bible, we can tell which one is God's church. All we have to do is say, well, what was God's church like? What was the church as it was originally started like? What are the identifying marks of God's church? We looked at several last time, so this this lesson we're going to dive into some new ones. Number one, the name. The name. The name of a church often designates uh, who founded it or ownership. Why do we use the name Church of Christ? Well, one reason is because it designates the owner. And if you notice Matthew 16, 18, as we called your attention to that, we see that Jesus said he would build his church. You know English, H-I-S is a possessive word. It's my church, Jesus says. In Matthew 16, 18, I, we talked last time about Jesus being the founder as one of the identifying marks. And then now the name shows his ownership. When we go to the Bible, we see other references to the church, but they still designate God as being the owner. For example, if we were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Paul writes to the church in Corinth there, we read a reference to the church simply as the church of God. When you see that phrase in the New Testament, church of God, or gift of Holy Spirit. It usually simply references possession or ownership. The Holy Spirit gave gifts on Acts, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, and those gifts were His to give, were they not? Therefore, gift of the Holy Spirit references the ownership. Church of God references whose church it is. Church of Christ references ownership. In Acts chapter 20 and 28, we're told that the elders are to be overseers to feed the church of God. This is why we use this name. It references ownership, references God as the owner. In uh, another instance, we read that the church is called the house of God, meaning, of course, that it's God's house. It's his house. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
And uh, verse 15 we read that, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. There it is again, the possession, the ownership. The designation when we say the church of Christ, we didn't just come up with that as like, well, let's create a church and let's pray to the Holy Spirit and see what kind of name he gives us. The name churches of Christ is a scriptural one. If we go to Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, we see that the churches in these different locations are referred to simply as the churches of Christ. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you can read the church at Laodicea, the church at this location. And how do we refer to all these different locations? The churches of Christ. And why do we use that term? Because it designates ownership. Christ said he would build it. It's his church. We call it his church. Now, of course, we understand that as you travel around the country, or around the world, you see the name Church of Christ. Just because it's on the building does not guarantee that what goes on matches what God established. But it does help you understand whose church is this. And if I were to go to some place and I see a name other than Christ... It really, to me, just begs the question, whose church is this? Whose church is this? Who founded it? Who owns it? Who started it? Who are we trying to honor? You can draw your own conclusions or talk to the individuals inside, but if I were to talk to those individuals inside, I would ask that question. Whose church is this? Who who started it? And who are you trying to honor? Because the name on the outside isn't Christ. The name of the followers as well. We use the name Christian. And that indicates who we follow. Why is that important? Because that's who deserves to be. uh, That's whose name we need to wear Because Christ died for us. In Acts 11.26, we read simply that the disciples were called Christians. That's it. Well, you might think, well, of course that's it. That's very logical. I know it's logical, but in today's society, there are so many hyphens that need to be added to the word Christian. We could list them on a whole page of paper. The denominational world, if I say to them, I'm a Christian, they might say, well, what kind of Christian? Are you a Baptist Christian, a Methodist Christian, an Episcopalian Christian? Well, I believe in elders, but that doesn't make me an Episcopalian. The Bible teaches we're supposed to have elders, but that doesn't make me an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian. Those words come from the words for elder. I believe that baptism is essential because the Bible teaches it, but that doesn't make me a Baptist Christian. I believe in all the things the Bible teaches. And what does that make me? It makes me a Christian. That's it. And it certainly doesn't make me something that wears somebody else's name. I'm not a Lutheran Christian. Because Luther didn't die for me on the cross. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth who were having that exact same problem. They'd all been baptized, they'd all become Christians, but then they started wearing these certain names and said, well, what kind of Christian are you? Basically, that's what they were saying, weren't they? Paul said, every one of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I of Christ. Well, how did Paul react to that? He said, was Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Do you see what he's saying? Why in the world are you dividing yourself up into all these? Well, I'm a Cephas Christian, and I'm a Paul Christian, and I'm a Jesus Christian. Paul says, this is ridiculous. You were baptized in the name of Christ. Christ died for you. Call yourself a Christian and leave it. How about creed? Let's move on from name to creed. Creed meaning the book that we follow, the book that dictates how we live our life or what we teach. When it comes to the church that we read about in the Bible, we only read about the Word of God being the creed, the words of Jesus. 
The Bible is described as sufficient for doctrine, for rebuking, reproving. And if you want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, this is where the Bible says that. How do we know what doctrine we teach? How do we know how to rebuke or reprove someone when they're doing something that's wrong? How do we teach people how to do what's right? The Bible says it's sufficient for all that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 reminds us that all Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. So what is a creed book for? Usually it's for doctrine, so that you can rebuke and reprove somebody when they do something wrong, and to teach people how to be righteous. Well, the Bible says, got it covered. Got it covered. And not only that, but also every good work. The following verse in 2 Timothy 3.17 tells us that the man of God with the Bible is complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So, do we need another creed book other than the Bible? If the Bible is sufficient, like it claims it is, then extra revelations, extra creed books, extra catechisms are not necessary. In fact, if we think about it logically... We'll see that it just doesn't make sense. It's not necessary. The Bible even goes further to say it's the only thing, everything that we have, in other words, has been revealed for life and godliness. In Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 we read, His divine power has granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You want to know how to have eternal life? You've got that in the Bible. You want to know how to live and be like God? You've got that in the Bible. As been said before, when we look at the idea of a creed, any creed book or catechism separate and apart from the Bible is going to fall into one of these three categories. If it contains less than the Bible, keeping in mind that the Bible is complete and sufficient, if it contains less than the Bible, then obviously it is insufficient. Because what the Bible has is sufficient. Right? So if it has less, it's insufficient. Well, what if a catechism or a creed book has more than the Bible? Well, again, if the Bible is sufficient and you've got something that's more than sufficient, we call that superfluous or padding or unnecessary. That's the definition of superfluous, going above that which you need in a way that makes it really pretty much unnecessary. And then, of course, the final option is if you've got a creed book and a catechism and it's the same as the Bible then it's just redundant because it's the exact same thing you already had. Any one of these categories, being that the Bible is sufficient, shows that any other creed book or catechism is just not necessary. What about organization? How the church is organized? We understand from Scripture that Jesus is the head of the church on a universal sense. There are congregations all around the world. Jesus is the head. Ephesians chapter 1 makes that very clear in verses 22 and 23. He has put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, referencing Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the church which is his body. Another name for the church is his body. Now on the local sense, we understand and we can read uh, qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 as well as the book of Titus. Elders are to oversee the local congregation. Acts 20, 28, which we mentioned before, told us that the elders are overseers And part of their duty is to feed the church of God, to make sure that they have the spiritual food. Deacons, we also know, serve as ministers under the oversight of elders. Again, qualifications can be read in 1 Timothy 3 as well as Titus. And all the individual members are to be subject to the elders that oversee them. All of us are to be subject to the elders. As Hebrews chapter 13 says, And verse 17 reminds us, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. 
that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. We are to make it to where the elders think it is a joy to oversee this congregation because we love them so much, we support them so much, we pray for them. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean they're perfect. If they come up and say, well, we're going to try this new doctrine and it doesn't match the Bible, then we have to say, uh, 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 just a minute. You know, we need to look at that very closely and follow the Bible. But as long as there's being scriptural, I need to support my elder and subject myself to their authority because that's what the Bible says to do. Churches that have a different hierarchy, such as an earthly headquarters, Paul, uh, I believe it was Paul, said our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our headquarters is. That's where our citizenship is. It's in heaven. Jesus is the head. He's in heaven. We don't have an earthly headquarters that oversee regional districts and, and all this. And this is the regional section. And this president oversees this section and this president. That's not scriptural. We don't have head elders or archbishops or popes. That idea originated from the idea that Peter was supposedly some head elder. We don't read about head elders in the Bible. We just read about elders. There's no one elder that's over all the other elders as an archbishop or a pope. That was invented by man, not in the Word of God. What about our worship? Well, if the Bible really is the only creed book as we noticed earlier, then it should be the final voice of authority, should it not? What does Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 remind us? Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Everything we do needs to have the authority of Jesus. In the name of Jesus references His authority. With his approval. Why do we worship the way we do? The worship of the churches of Christ are the way they are because we can go to the Bible and we can see biblical authority for it. If you remember uh, uh, the different ways that you get biblical authority, there's the explicit instruction, the implicit instruction, or the approved or binding example. And some people may look and say, well, why don't you use mechanical instruments, instruments of music? Why don't you have choirs? Why don't you have all these things? The simple reason is because when we go to the New Testament, we don't have any explicit commands for it. We don't have any implicit commands for it. And we don't see any approved or binding examples of it. Therefore, we don't have authority for it. And if we don't have authority for it, not from God, then the only other person that's giving authority is me. <laughs> and I'm not going to rely on me to do what pleases God. I'm going to go to God and say, what please, you tell me what pleases you. Right. Why do we sing? Because in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, as well as Ephesians 5, 19, the word of Christ should dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's the purpose of our singing, is to teach, to admonish, to instruct, to edify, to build each other up. Some people say, well, our singing's not really good and my tunes are really off and I can't hit the right key. You know what? That's not really the point of the singing. Amen. The point of the singing is to pay attention to the words and to learn and to be edified and to be built up and to praise our Father. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's the instrument that we use, the heart. We use our heart to sing to God. One lady told me one time, you're the church that doesn't have music. I said, well, actually, yes, we do have music. It's singing. We sing. We sing and make melody in our heart to the Lord. That's the music that's authorized, and that's the music that we use. Praying. We, of course, read in the Scripture that praying to God is acceptable. Paul told the church in Philippi, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer prayer. And supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We also partake of the Lord's Supper as we did earlier 
In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we read the example, the approved or binding example of the first century Christians was that they were coming together to break bread. That's a reference to the Lord's Supper. And along that same line in the same reference, we read that preaching occurred. Also from the same verse, Acts chapter 20 verse 7, Paul preached unto them. Part of their worship service was to take a moment to listen to what God's word had to say to them so that they could think about it. Think about their lives, try to build themselves up and get prepared to live as a Christian in a better way every day that they possibly could. And of course we give. Another approved or a binding example was Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 telling the churches of Galatia as well as here in Corinth upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. If a church worships in a different way, our simple question might be, where's your biblical authority for it? You've got something that is different than what we do? Just answer me that. Show me in the Bible where you're authorized to do that. Where's your biblical authority? Here's the hint. If it's not from God and not authorized by God, there's only one other place it came from, and that's the mind of man. And when I approach God in worship, and by the way, God is the audience of our worship, not man. Man does not get together in worship to please man. Man comes to approach God and please God. God is the audience of our worship. If God is going to be pleased, then I'm going to do what God wants me to do, not what I've invented for myself. And next we notice that the church is undenominational. It's often said if you went to somebody on the day of Pentecost who'd just been baptized, maybe it was one of the Jews that were there and they said, you asked the Jew, what what'd you just do? And they said, well, I was baptized in order to have my sins washed away. And then you said, well, that, well that's great. What denomination are you? They'd probably just look at you with a dumbfounded face saying, what, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean, what denomination am I? What, what does that mean? Most of the denominations point their history back to the Reformation movement about 500 years ago where it revolted against the Catholic Church. But if we go back even further, even before the Catholic Church started, we find people on the day of Pentecost saying, I've been baptized, and you say, what are you? They say, well, I'm a Christian. And that's all there was to it. Because there were no denominations back then. We, understand, we need to understand what the word denominate means. You have potentially in your wallet, if you want to share with me later to prove I'm right, that's fine. You may have money in your wallet. And that money is denominated. You ever heard that word before? Denominations of bills. It means the same thing in your currency that it does in religion, and that means divide. That's what the word means. To denominate something is to divide it up. This bill is worth $20. This bill is worth $10. This bill is worth $5. That's denomination. That's denominating. I am dividing something up and separating them. The $20 bill is not or ever will be the same equivalent as the $10 bill. It has been divided and separated. Well, when we come to religion, it means the exact same thing. The definition of denominate is to divide and split. The interesting thing that we note is Jesus did not pray for division. Jesus prayed for unity. We just saw that and heard that in our scripture reading, right? John chapter 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. What's your hope for them, Jesus, that they all may be one? It doesn't take a PhD to understand you cannot be one and yet also still be divided. The idea of denominating is division. But Jesus here says they all may be one. How? What are you talking about, Jesus? Let's continue reading. As thou, Father, art in me, 
and I in thee. Did Jesus come and teach things that contradicted what the Father wanted? Jesus said in the book of John, everything I do pleases the Father. If Jesus did come and preach something opposite, that would be denominating or dividing. He says, I want them to be one. I want the followers to be one. How? Even as we are one. Even as Jesus and the Father are united, that's what he said. I want my followers to be just like that. I want them to be united. I in them, thou in me. Paul stated there's only one faith. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. There's one Lord, one faith. And Paul stated there's only one faith, but he went on further to say in the same chapter that we are supposed to have unity in that faith. Skip down from Ephesians 4, 5 where he says there's one faith. And let's look at Ephesians um, chapter 4 and verse 13. Now he says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. There's not only one faith, Paul says we're supposed to be unified in it. That harmonizes with what Jesus said, that we need to be one. The simple point is to denominate or to divide is to do the exact opposite of what Jesus prayed for and what Paul taught through the Holy Spirit. To split, to break up, to teach different faiths, different ideas, different types of a doctrine that contradict each other, that goes against what Jesus prayed for. We see in the scripture that the church is the body, Ephesians chapter 1. He's being uh, given to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. And then once again, we look that the church is the body, but there's only one body. Ephesians chapter 4, 4, there's one body. If there's only one body, there's only one church because the church is the body. There's not supposed to be hundreds of different denominations. There's only supposed to be one. There's one body. I don't even recommend using the phrase non-denominational because the world often interprets that as pro-denominational. Non-denominational usually means we're not going to support any one denomination. We're actually going to support all of them. Well, that's not what Jesus wanted because he didn't want to support division. I think a better phrase to use is undenominational. That simply means we are not denominational. In other words, we're not a separate group and we don't support breaking into separate groups. The different identifying marks of God's church we've seen are here. Jesus is the builder, the foundation. The church started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. It uses a name that shows us uh, ownership of God. It follows the Bible as its creed. It follows scriptural organization and worship, and it is undenominational. Any church that does not bear these marks is counterfeit. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org.